Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. Our mission is to glorify God and to make disciples by bringing the gospel into all of life in all the earth. This is Chris Kipp, lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And if you've not joined us in a worship gathering or at a house church yet, we would love to have you join us. You can find out more information at rin-church.org. And I pray that you are encouraged and edified by the proclamation of God's word today. We started a series two weeks ago called Empowered, and it's a series about the Holy Spirit and his role in our lives. And Jason did a fantastic job talking about uh, uh, cessationism versus continue, uh, continuationism, if we can say those words, big words, right? And I know that there's probably been some great conversations that you guys had. I've heard a little bit great conversations around that topic this week. We're, we're going to be continuing in that this morning, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you want to start turning there. And uh, I was thinking this week of when Casey and I got married a long time ago, back in the, the wonderful year of 2006, we got married. And we did what probably a lot of you married folks did, is we had a registry. And so we got to go to Target in whatever other place we wanted to go. And we made a list of things like, hey, if you want to buy a gift for us, and we put it on the list, right? And so people gave us gifts, which was so fantastic. And some of them colored outside the lines, right? You, you, you guys know. Some of them got a little creative, okay, which we loved. We, we got these really cool gifts that we, it's like we, we never would have asked for that, but it was so cool. But then there were a couple others. <laughs> have you all experienced that before? You know, it almost looked like maybe they were re-gifting something that they didn't really want. You know, they're like, oh gosh, there's a wedding this weekend. Oh, let's just give them this, right? Like this thing out of the dark corner of their closet. And uh, what do you do with a gift like that? Regift it. It's called a white elephant party. You ever heard of that before? Christmas time, you get to unload all those, right? All the gifts you never wanted. Well, um, if you're really brazen, if you're, if you're hardcore, you drive that joker straight to Goodwill and you drop it off, right? And you, and you push it out and, you, and you, you squeal out of there before they can stop you because you don't want that thing back in your house, okay? But we're not like that. We're not that hardcore. Okay, so what, what we did is what probably a lot of you did is we took that gift and we found another dark corner of a closet somewhere and we put it in there. And it stayed there until we moved, right? How many of you, when you were moving, finally got rid of all the junk that people gave you that you didn't really want? You're like, this is our chance to throw it away. A few of you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Moves are great for that. I started thinking about how many gifts God has given to us that sit in closets in our life. And I just wondered if there's some things that God's deposited into our hearts, our souls, our beings, that um, for whatever reason are sitting dormant. There's a plug right here on the wall, and there's plugs all over this room. And that plug is there, and there's power that runs through those cables all over this room, and it's there 24-7, 365, all the time. But it's only when we take something that we need to do and we plug it in to that wall and we begin to receive that power we're putting it in to use it it, it lies dormant it's there it's there but we don't use it until we plug into it and here's my heart here's my desire for this series is I'm hoping that in some way there's, there's the connection point for you where you see how God has put something in your life to be used for his glory and, and your good and for the blessing and, and, and the, uh, the building up of other people, right? That, that you would see that and there'd be a moment where you, could, you just plug in to that thing, that you are truly empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um. We're going to be looking at the gift list today, okay? So we're going to be diving into something that might make you a little bit uncomfortable, 
but it's going to be okay. I promise you. We're going to have a great time. We're going to look all over the word. In fact, I'm going to take you into multiple scriptures today because what I want more than anything is I want your understanding to rest on God's word and not Chris, not Chris's word. Okay, so that, that's what we're going to do this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm hoping that somewhere along the way, as we're talking about these different things, that there might be a moment where you say, I think I might have that. Or you might say, I think you might have that. And I'm hoping that you're going to lean in on every one of the gifts that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. So, are y'all ready? You ready? All right, here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 4, and here's what he says. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, Now there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. Verse 7, a manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. Now, you know that word manifestation is like when there's something that's obscured to you that you're, 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 you're not even sure that it's there or whatever, and then all of a sudden something happens and you see it and you're like, oh. That's it, right? That's, that's what that means. It, there's a, a manifestation of the Spirit of God in each person for the common good. Verse 8, to one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by one Spirit. To another, the performing of miracles to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. One and the same spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as he wills. This is the word of the Lord. Now, I I want you to understand the context of what's happening here in 1 Corinthians. If you read 1 Corinthians, what you're going to see is that Paul is having to correct some things that are frankly rated R that are happening in the church. And so he gets to the, all the correction about the, the sin things that are going on inside the church that were all kinds of messed up, right? And then when he gets to this part, 1 Corinthians 12, it's so interesting to me that he doesn't say, time out on the whole spiritual gifts things. Eh, stop it, shut it down. That's weird because you guys need to sort out some things first. Rather, what he says, he goes on to say in the following chapters, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Interesting. And this tells us that the misuse or abuse of spiritual gifts does not mean that we go open the closet door of our life, put the gift in there, shut the door and walk away and be like, no more. Rather, what Paul's driving them to is that they would understand how do we use this appropriately. He's going to teach them. He's going to bring correction so they can take this stuff that got put in them and use it rightly for the common good for God's glory and the advancement of the kingdom. And you hear him, the same spirit, one and the same spirit, the same Lord. He's striving for unity and he's trying to get rid of any sense of elitism among them. Of like, oh, this gift is great and this gift, eh, whatever. You know? No, no, no. He's saying, look, this is all the same work of the Holy Spirit. And he gives us a list. And I just want to just remind us of what a spiritual gift is. I think I have a uh, definition of a spiritual gift. This was from Sam Storms, The Beginner's Guide to Spiritual Gifts. This is a great book. If you're wanting to learn more to dive deeper into this, I recommend it. Here's what he says. It's a God-given and gracious capacity to serve the body of Christ. It is a divinely empowered, spiritually energized potential to minister to the body of Christ by communicating the knowledge, power, and love of Jesus. Divinely empowered, 
spiritually energized potential. That plug has potential energy in it. And it's not realized until I'm plugged into it. It's a potential that God gives to us to communicate the knowledge and the power and the love of Jesus. We can say it this way. A spiritual gift is when God goes public among us. When he says, hello, I'm here. We're like, oh yeah, I knew you were here, but like I forget sometimes. And like when that happened, I'm like, oh God, God's really here going public among us. Now, I want to be clear as we go through this series what I'm not advocating for. I'm not advocating for pressure to be superhuman. Does that make sense? Because we are fallible people. We, we have a flesh that is weird and twisted sometimes. We have desires in us. We have a whole broken story that's a part of our past. What we're talking about, Jesus setting us free, right? We're, we're walking into that freedom in greater and greater capacities. We have, we have strengths and we have weaknesses. We have abilities, right? We, we have faults. All those things are a part of the makeup. So when we're talking about having a spiritual gift, I'm not talking about everyone be super awesome now. Because the gift was never meant to point to our awesomeness. It's meant to point to God's reality. Always meant to point to God is living, active, working here among us and he loves you and he cares about you and I just want to tell you, I want to use whatever gift God's put inside of me to make sure that you know that because he loves you so much. That's what it's all about. So no pressure to be human or superhuman. It's regular people like me and you who have been given this this enablement by God's spirit to, to be used for the blessing and upbuilding of other people. So, so important for us. Now, I want us to begin looking at the gifts, okay? So he's going to list nine, and let's just kind of just highlight the nine real quick. I think I have a slide for this for you as well. He says this in verse seven, eight, I'm sorry, a message of wisdom, right? A message of knowledge, faith, Gifts of healing, the performing of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. He lists nine, nine right here. And what we're going to do over the next couple weeks is just focus on these nine because these nine are uh, probably the most misunderstood of all of the gifts that are listed in the Bible. Okay, these are the ones that cause all kinds of like weird feelings for people. And they're like, I don't know about that. And you know, it's like, these need a little bit more of us understanding. So we're going to look at the nine, but I just want to point you to the other places where gifts are listed in Romans 12, six through eight. Uh, Paul says this, according to the grace, uh, grace given to us, we have different gifts, prophecy, Use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, that's a gift. Use it in service. If teaching, in teaching, exhorting, in exhortation, giving, that's a gift. With generosity, leading, with diligence, mercy, with cheerfulness. First Peter 4, 10 through 11, he's going to give just kind of do two categories. And he says, if anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. And if anyone serves, let it be from the strength that God's providing. So he's just going to look at two categories of serving gifts or speaking gifts. And then there's Ephesians 4, 7 through 13, where it talks about the fivefold gifts. He's given uh, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip God's people for works of service. Again, all of these are valid gifts by the Spirit that are listed in Scripture, but we're going to focus on the nine, okay? And today, what I want to do is focus specifically on this word of knowledge or word of wisdom. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom. What in the world does the word of knowledge or word of wisdom mean? That's what we're going to look at today. Before we dive in, 
I heard a pastor say this. Um, he had been praying for people in his church to be healed. The problem was nobody ever got healed. And so he called some people that had seen other people healed and asked them, you know, what to do. And uh, he got some great um, feedback from them. And he gathered all of his leaders together. And here's what he said. Um, whenever the Bible has one reality and our experience is a different reality, we shouldn't lower the Bible to match our experience. He says, what we should do is we should pray, God, would you please raise my experience to the level of your word? And then he got his, um, his, his leaders, and before the service, he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray uh, Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3, over every chair. And, and that verse says, um, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all of his benefits. He cleanses all your iniquity, forgives all your iniquity, and he heals all your diseases. And all we're going to do is just pray, God, would you fulfill your word here? We're going to be praying for sick people. Lord, would you please do this and reveal your power among us? And as we look at these gifts, these are gifts listed in the scripture for us. And if you've had a crazy experience or, or if you've had no experience with this, here's what I'm asking you to do is say, God, this is what your word says. And I just want you to please lift my experience to match your word. Amen. Okay, let's do that together. So what is the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. What are those? Great question. Let's start there. So it's not that easy for us to define because Paul doesn't stop and give a definition for every one of these things that he's listing. But here's what we can assume is that when he says, hey, one of you gives the word of knowledge and another by the same spirit word of wisdom is that these people were seeing this happen in their church and they're like, oh yeah, I know what that is because they're experiencing it. Now, we have to go back and do a little bit of understanding of what were they seeing that helps us know what that meant, okay? So um, the context of this, of this book is that wisdom and knowledge were the slogan of those who were opposing the gospel that Paul is preaching in Corinth. And if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he's going to use the words wisdom and knowledge a lot. And he's going to talk about the message of the cross is foolishness. It does not compute to their wisdom and knowledge, right? To those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. He says things like, we, we, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews because all they want are signs. And it's a stumbling block to the Greeks because all they want is knowledge and wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. So he's, he's using this back and forth all over the place in the book of, of Corinthians. And we see this theme of wisdom and knowledge. And some, uh, some Christians take that and they think, well, Anyone who gives a knowledgeable or wise response to a spiritual question or issue has word of wisdom, word of knowledge. That, that, that's, that's a reasonable understanding of the phrase. I'm just not sure that's what Paul has in mind here. And let, let me tell you why. In the verses surrounding this, and this is a great thing for you, as someone who reads the Bible, here's what I encourage you to do. Whenever you have a question about the Bible, answer it with the Bible. We say it this way, use the Bible to understand the Bible. As soon as we start taking something else and importing it into the scriptures, all of a sudden we've opened the door for all kinds of heresies and problems and things. It's really, really important as you study the scripture, whenever you have a question, use the Bible to understand the Bible. Does that make sense? No? Okay, that's all right. I have context verses. Can you put those up for us right there? 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And we're just going to look at what are the surrounding contexts that he's talking about. In 13, uh, verse 2, he says this, If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all, here's our word, knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. 
So he's talking about uh, this gift of prophecy and understanding mysteries and knowledge in the same breath. Okay? 1 Corinthians 14, 6. Context. So now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues. Oh, we're going to get to that in a few weeks. Don't worry. How will I benefit you unless I speak to you with a revelation? Here's our word. Or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. Again, we're, we're seeing this in the same breath as knowledge. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then, brothers and sisters, whenever you come together, I loved this, each one has a hymn. Wasn't that beautiful? Havana leading us. Each one has a hymn, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything is to be done for the building up. The context surrounding this word knowledge, this is, this is me as someone who has to read it and make sense of it. You might read it and you make sense of it differently. I understand that. There's room for that here. When I read this, I see this knowledge or wisdom gift being something that is a spontaneous revelation that comes by the Holy Spirit in the moment. It's the right word at the right time. Okay? Y'all with me so far? Good. So, using that, let's talk about what is a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge? I have a definition for you. These are spiritual gifts in which God supernaturally reveals knowledge or wisdom that was otherwise unattainable. Key phrase. These revelations are to be spoken for the edification of the church and slash or the advancement of God's purposes in the life of of another person. And this can be confused with prophecy. Knowledge has to do with what. Wisdom has to do with how. Okay? Word of knowledge reveals information that is verif verifiable right now. Okay? It reveals God's omniscience that he knows everything about every person. If you want a key verse, Psalm 139, you created my inmost parts. You perceive me from far away. It says in verses two of Psalm 139, you know when I sit down and when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from far away. And when the Lord uses somebody to speak a word of knowledge, he's revealing some sort of information that that person says, oh my gosh, how did you know that? You say, I didn't. God knows everything about you. And he told me this because there's something that he wants you to know right now. He loves you. He cares about you. Okay? It reveals his omniscience. Word of wisdom is different. It's future-oriented. It's going to talk about how. A word of knowledge I can verify right now. I know this about you, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's true, and I, and I can prove that to you. Word of wisdom has more to do with the right timing. It's a timing word, or the right way to do something, or with the right people, where someone tells you something about what's, you know, they know something that you're about to do, and they tell you about the right timing, or the right person, the right people, right? And it's just like a Whoa, how did you know that? For example, one Sunday, I was leading worship at a church that we used to be, I was on staff at, and after the service, a woman walks up to me, and she says, I need to tell you something, and I'm like, okay. She said, as you were leading worship, I just saw this massive angel behind you, and I was like, wow, but then the Lord just started to reveal something for, for you, and then she said this, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out your tent pegs, your dwelling place. What she did not know is that very week, Casey and I, were, we were wrestling with, should we add on to our house right now because we're about to have another kid and we have like no more room or should we not? How did she know that? She didn't know that. God knew that and God used her to speak to us. We added on to that house, we sold that puppy and we made lots of money. Praise Jesus. 
Amen, right? She was using a gift of the Spirit to reveal something that was, this is key, tomorrow's answers today, word of wisdom. Tomorrow's answers today. It reveals God as the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Isaiah 46.10 is a key verse for this gift. It says, I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place and I will do all my will. Word of wisdom. Now, let's think about where do we see this in the Bible? Because we need to use the Bible to understand the Bible. Let me just kind of walk you through some stories that you probably already know. When you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see over and over again that Jesus knew their thoughts. Jesus knew what they were thinking. Over and over again, Jesus is is using what we would call a word of knowledge to know exactly what's happening in a moment, even though there's no other way that he would know that. Another example, Mark 11, at the triumphal entry, Jesus instructs his disciples to go into town and he tells them, when you get there, you're going to find a colt tied up. It's never been ridden on before. And when the owner asks you, I want you to tell them the Lord needs it and he'll send it back as soon as we're done. That's what he told them. And they walked into town, and guess what? Everything happened just as they knew. It was a word of wisdom. It was timing, right place, right person, right, right? Okay, word of wisdom. Another example, this is a fun one. Acts chapter five, verses one through 11, Ananias and Sapphira. Do you have y'all heard the story of Ananias and Sapphira before in Acts chapter five? So all these people in the early church, they are selling their properties, their houses, their lands, whatever, and they're bringing all the profits and they're laying it at the apostles' feet. And Ananias and Sapphira are joining in this. They sold a piece of property, And here's what happened. They said, we're giving it all to the Lord. And they march it in there in front of the apostles and they lay down whatever money that they had uh, said they were going to give, right? But it says in their hearts, they had decided to keep back part of it. And Peter looks at Ananias and he says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? He says, you have not lied to people, but to God. And Ananias falls over dead. A rough day to be an usher at church. <laughs> Carrying dead bodies out, right? Ah. Sapphira marches in a little bit after him and does the very same thing. And Peter says, why would you lie to the Holy Spirit? And she falls over dead. Again, a rough day to be an usher at church. How did Peter know? How would he even know that that happened? The Spirit reveals a word of knowledge. And by the way, the sin of Ananias' fire was not that they didn't give, it's that they said they were giving and they weren't. Does that make sense? Genesis 41, old school, Old Testament. Joseph, son of Jacob with the coat of many colors. You've you've probably heard about Joseph. Pharaoh has a dream. Joseph is still in the dungeon in Egypt. And Pharaoh has a dream and he's troubled and no one can explain the dream to him. His cupbearer says, oh yeah, I remember there's a guy named Joseph that was in the dungeon with me. You should talk to him. He knows how to interpret dreams. And so he brings out Joseph and says the dream. And Joseph says immediately, well, there's going to be seven years of abundance and seven years of famine. Here's what you need to do. Appoint wise people. You need to set aside the, the, a fifth of all the abundance that happens in the first seven years. And if you'll do that, then you're going to be okay for the seven years of famine. How did he know? How, how, was he calculating math of like, well, a bushel of wheat is this. And I think if we had one fifth of that, no. Joseph is receiving in the moment a wise word of how do we do this? Here's what's going to happen. And here's how we need to take action right now. Word of wisdom. John chapter 4. The woman at the well. 
Jesus asks for a drink. And it leads to a whole conversation about living water and all that kind of stuff. And then he says, go call your husband. And she says, I have no husband. He said, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the one you're with now is not your husband. How did he know that? Jesus has a word of knowledge. And guess what? It opens her heart to receive the ministry of Jesus. So we see these examples in the Bible. There's something like a word of knowledge or word of wisdom that God is using from Old Testament all the way through the the early church. We see this all the way through. Another example, not in the Bible, Charles Spurgeon, prince of preachers, teaching at Exeter Hall in London. In the middle of his sermon, he looks off to the side and he says this. He says, young man, those gloves you are wearing have not been paid for. You have stolen them from your employer. And then he keeps going on with the, with the message. Now, what you need to know is that there are like tens of thousands of people in attendance at Exeter Hall in London, right? There's thousands of people there. And he just has this in the middle of his sermon and keeps going. And as you can imagine, at the end of the service, a young, pale, agitated young man comes up and he's kind of like, ah. and he asks to speak with Charles Spurgeon and he says this to him. He says, um, it's the first time I've robbed my master and I'll never do it again. You won't expose me, sir, will you? It would kill my mother if she knew I'd become a thief. How did that happen? How did he know that? Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, okay? So now that we're beginning to understand what it is, let's talk about how do you know if you're getting a word of wisdom or word of knowledge? Because that's where most of us are like, uh, that's all really cool, but I don't know if that's me, and how would I even know if that's me? Let's talk about that, okay? Um, in the workplace, you hear the term soft skills. Have you all heard that before, soft skills? So when you're in, you know, in your workplace, they, they want you to be able to do the job in a sense of like, you, know, you need to know how to use the software and complete the task or whatever type of you know, business you're in. But then they also want to know like, do you have the emotional intelligence to read what's happening in a meeting and respond appropriately? Okay, they want to know, do you have the soft skills? Is there an emotional intelligence, a relational intelligence that you can work with people? It's a soft skill. And I think there's some soft skills that are helpful. And in 1 Corinthians uh, 2, verse 14, he says that the person without the spirit does not receive what comes from God's spirit because it is foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. Meaning when you're born again and the spirit of God seals you, right? You begin to learn how to evaluate things spiritually and there are some soft skills that come with that. This is hard because Paul doesn't say, and then here's how you'll know when you have a word of knowledge. So we have to do what the Vineyard Church in Anaheim did was they asked people who consistently had words of knowledge or word of wisdom, how do you know when you're having one? Here's what they found. They found five ways that people who, that regularly had this gift knew they were having what we would call like an impression or whatever from God. Here, here was the first one. They would feel it. What does that mean? Well, they described it this way. When I am praying with someone, I'm with someone like, you know, and, and I'm, I'm seeking to minister to that person, sometimes I will feel a pain in my body that I don't have, right? I'll have a shooting pain somewhere and I never have pain there. So I'm like, well, maybe the Lord's impressing something on me. And so they'll say, huh, my left wrist hurts. Sir, are you experiencing any wrist pain? They feel something, okay? Second is that they said they would feel, think it. 
And this would be an impression or a knowing that comes to you by the Holy Spirit. And what they found is that it's extremely rare for anyone who has this gift to hear an audible voice or, or a, yeah, like an audible voice from God, like in their spirit. It's just, they just have a thought and they think well, that thought didn't originate with me. That came from somewhere else. They think it. Third is that they would see it. So they, they would have almost like a daydream or a mental picture, a mental movie, or what some call a vision. Again, a vision is much more rare, but people would just see something. Now, when I was in Cuba, um, I was on my second trip there. We were, we were working with um, house church movement leaders. And you need to understand in Cuba, this is serious business because there's a state authorized church, and then there's a whole movement that's happening that's under the radar. Communist government, things were happening under the radar to advance the gospel. So I'm in a room, I'm praying with these guys that are like top dog national house church movement leaders in Cuba, and we're praying, and we're doing half in English and half in Spanish, and we're back and forth singing songs in English and Spanish and praying and you know, back and forth. And as we're praying, I see over, and it's not like I, I, it's, I saw it in, in, my, in my mind's eye that there was a cloud over the heart of one of the leaders. And so I freaked out because these are top dog leaders. And who am I, right? And so I didn't say a word. And I go back to the hotel and it's just bothering me. And so there were two guys leading our trip and I went to them privately and I said, hey, when we were praying, I felt like I saw something and it's bothering me. What do you think I should do? And they, I explained the whole thing and they said, you should probably tell him. Great. You know, throw him out there and let him just get kicked down. Let the idiot go talk, right? Whatever, you know, you just have those thoughts of like, I'm such a fool, I don't know what I'm doing. You know? And so I go to the man the next day, I find a moment when he's not like with everybody and I'm like, hey, when we were praying, I felt like I saw a cloud over your heart. Does that mean anything to you? And here's what he said. He said, wow, um, this was, I think it was like summertime. He said, back in January, I went to the heart doctor because I was having like numbness in my left arm and all the like signs of like heart problems. And there you go to the doctor and it's very different, okay? And they never told me what the results of my tests were. I have to go back to that doctor to find out what they were. And I feel like maybe the Lord's telling me to go back and figure out what was going on with my heart. He, didn't, he hasn't died yet. I don't know if anything happened. But it was a moment where I saw something as we were praying and I had to act on it even though I felt like, oh, that's embarrassing. I don't want to do it, okay? Another way is they said they would say it. And maybe this has happened to you. You're talking with someone and then something comes out of your mouth and you're like, wait a minute. There was something on that that was not from me. Like the spirit was moving in that Phrase and I said that, and I feel like that's something that you need to pay attention to. You say it. Lastly, is that you experience it. This is really hard to explain, and uh, this was a story. This is an anecdotal thing. All this is anecdotal. This is what people say, okay? But here's, here's what this pastor said. He was in a town, and back in the old days, y'all probably know this, that there were phones, and all those phones were on the same line, and if somebody's on that line already, you have to like hang it up and wait for them to finish. So his wife, now they're on a private landline. She picks up the phone. She hears two people talking, and she's like trying to hang it up. Because that's not supposed to happen here, right? We don't have that kind of a phone here. And she still hears hears it and you know she's trying all the things and finally she's like what, what's going on and it's a man speaking suggestively to a woman trying to find a, a time to meet and she knows this is adulterous so she hangs it up she's like that was weird and that following Sunday uh, at the end of the service she said she, she felt like the Lord prompted her I want you to talk about what you heard on the phone today or this week 
So she gets up and she's like, and she does it very like nebulously. She says, if you're here today and you're toying with the thought of sin and it has something to do with your telephone, I want you to come forward right now. <laughs> no one comes forward. She's like, okay, fade into the background, right? You know, she goes back to her seat. And it's a set up tear down church. And so it takes them about an hour to tear down everything. At the end of the tear down, a man comes back to the church in tears. And he tells her, that's me and I know it. And he confessed that he was, he was planning an adulterous affair with a woman and he repented to the Lord. Wow. All this to say is that the Holy Spirit will let us know things and we're, there's a soft skill where we're beginning to think, okay, that didn't come from me, that was from the Lord. And I'm dialing into that, okay? How do we know? Here's some practical ways for us to do that is to cultivate personal intimacy with the Lord. You're, you grow in this, right? You're, you need to be someone who just prays, reads the Bible. And when you're praying, just stop and listen. God, is there anything you wanna to say to me today? I'm, I'm all ears. Another way is just to keep your conscience clear because your conscience is the first place where you learn to hear God. It's that little voice inside of you that you remember when you were young and you would do something and then you'd be like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And you start, you, you, like, it bothers you. And when you get older, that conscience can be seared or calloused. And we do things that are wrong all the time and we don't think twice about it. And we need to go back and we need to make sure that we keep our consciences clear because that's where we are hearing the voice of the Lord, okay? And lastly, it's to let God's love and mercy be your motive, let it be your motive. We're going to talk about that in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, that was the second thing. How do I know? Third, how would I give a word of knowledge or word of wisdom? I'll do this quickly. Do it humbly. Start with this. I think maybe the Lord might be putting something on my heart for you. Is it okay if I share it? Don't say, the Lord showed me today. <laughs> And I can feel it right now. You know, it's like, there's no need for theatrics. There's no need for, it's just, uh, I have this impression from the Lord and I feel like I should tell you. And if it means something to you, awesome. If not, that's okay. Right, send it right on back. Let it go, okay? Do it humbly. Do it simply. There's no need to over-interpret a word. If the Lord shows you a cloud over someone's heart, you don't have to go and spend three weeks fasting and praying to figure out what was the cloud. Just say, hey, I, this is weird, but when we were praying, I saw a cloud over your heart. Does that mean anything to you? Simple, 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 okay? Um, third is this, take the risk. This is the hard part. Here's what we need to remember. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Isn't that great? Take the risk. When they say, oh, go tell him, you have to go out and go tell him, all right? Lastly is this, learn by trial and error. Learn by trial and error. If Dave is playing guitar over here and he misses a note, do I walk up here and be like, throw that guitar in the trash and never play it again? No, that would be like super hardcore. Like that's overly dramatic. Why would you say that, right? Because we all know we're people and sometimes we miss a note and that's okay. We say, oh, bummer. And then we keep playing, right? So when it comes to spiritual gifts, if you try something and it doesn't work out, you're like, yeah, throw it in the trash. No, 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 no. We're just learning. We're just learning. So learn by trial and error. Let me close with this. What would keep us from using the gift today? Why would we keep it in a dark corner of the closet neglected? 
And here's simply this. Maybe we just don't recognize the gift. It could just be an ignorance or a, like, I just don't recognize when it's happening. It could be a dismissal of the gift. Like, I just don't believe that that happens. I, I just, I, I don't. I'm a very skeptical person. I don't believe that that happens, right? We can dismiss the gift and Jesus experienced this in his own life. In Matthew 13, Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth and he's preaching and he's teaching and he's doing you know, all this incredible stuff. And they say, isn't that the carpenter's son? Like his, we know his brothers, like who did this guy think he is? And they took offense at him. And there's this curious thing. It says, he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And, and what we see happen in scripture is that whenever people are like, nope, doesn't happen, not real. It's like, well, then all of a sudden it, it doesn't happen. Does that make sense? Like there's, there's sort of like this lid of like disbelief over these types of things. And we need to be people who say, no, 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 God, you, you know the end from the beginning. You perceive thoughts from far away. I believe you do that, God. So we don't recognize it, we dismiss it. Lastly, we're afraid to try using it. We're afraid to try using it. I heard a great story this week of a man by the name of Sean Bowles who has a real distinct uh, gifting from the Lord in this area. And he was learning how to do this. And so he went to a coffee shop and he saw a guy and he really felt like he had something that the Lord put on his heart for this guy. And so he took the R-I-S-K and he goes over and he's like, hey, um, I'm a Christian and... Um, I believe the Lord sometimes puts something on my heart to tell another person just to encourage them and let them know that he loves them. And I just, I have something I feel like I need to share with you. Is it okay if I share with you? And the guy was like, sure. And he tells him whatever it was. And he says, does that mean anything to you? And the guy says, no, not at all. He's like, oh, that's okay, man. And so he walks off and the guy stops him and he says, tell me about this faith where you think the Lord is like giving you things for other people. I want to hear about that invites him to sit down and after 45 minutes this guy becomes a believer in Jesus Christ and I thought that was beautiful because here's a guy who has the gift that God's using and yet he's a guy who had to just take the risk and learn and even when he messed up guess what happened God moved isn't that beautiful let me close with this If the gift is about me, it's a danger to me. Because I'm still trying to prove something about myself, either to others or to myself. And this is why inner healing and emotional health are so important to our discipleship. Dysfunction will make everything about me. And if it's all about me, then I'm not yet free. But if I can shift my attention and my trust to the finished work of Jesus Christ on my behalf, then I have nothing left to prove. I'm free. I'm free to fail and I'm free to succeed. He loves me, he accepts me, he blesses me, he forgives me, he affirms me, he doesn't get nervous when I try something new out, right? And the basis of his love is not my performance, but his cross. Amen? The gospel empowers us to live in the gifts because it's not about me. It's all about him. It's all about his glory. And I'm free. So, what if we saw people's hearts connect with the love of God, with his love for them, his care for them, his purpose for them? What if they could, if they could see that, if they could realize he knows my name and he cares for me? Because we opened our hearts to the gifts of the Holy Spirit and we took the R-I-S-K. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Renaissance Church Sermon Podcast. To support our work, you can like, share, subscribe, or you can donate at rin-church.org.